Take two. Awesome. <laughs> this is so funny. All right, well, today, today I want to talk about Jesus. Today I want to talk about sheep, branches, reproduction. I want to talk about the church. I want to talk about how 80 to 90 percent of all churches are in decline or plateau. I want to talk about evangelism. Something that is something that we're supposed to center in our lives that we've misplaced somehow. I was talking to Brandon Beals this last week, and he was telling me about youth ministry, and he was talking about just different points that he's, he's made a goal in his life. He was talking about evangelism. He goes, you're not going to see it in your students until you see it in your own life. I thought that was interesting. Today I want to go to Matthew. Matthew 5, 13, and 14. It's a Sermon on the Mount. Most of us have heard it many times. The fact is, Jesus is up there and is teaching for days, they said. A lot of commentators just say that. And he's talking about the new kingdom. He's talking about the laws. He's talking about how people are supposed to follow God. And here he talks about salt and light. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Let's bow your heads. God, we come before you today, and we just pray that this text would open up a new life in our own lives. God, that it would, it would be revived, and as we've heard it so many times before, I pray that as we hear it again, it would just remind us of why you came. As you came to challenge us to live a better life, to be a salt and a light to the world, I pray that today we would see that again in our lives. And that we would take it out these doors, and that we would take it across the street into the world. In your name, amen. So once again, I want to ask you a question. Is it easy to do something you're good at? Or better yet, is it easy to sow in ministry something <clears throat> you are gifted in? Now we've all taken those gift tests, we're in the College of Ministry, and it all lists out what we're supposedly good at and what we're going to be best at in ministry. And if you're in the Thompson class, you've had it three or four times. And I remember my freshman year, I took that test and I was, and I was going through it, you know, I was aiming for some, and I was looking at these, and I was looking at some other ones that I didn't want to get, you know. Some of them you just don't want to do in ministry, I don't know, there's always those things. And when it came out, you know, I had a couple good ones. I had some wisdom, I had some leadership, some teamwork skills, you know, the basics. But I didn't have evangelism, especially on my top five. And Thompson was talking, he goes, only 4% of Christians, they say, have the gift of evangelism. I was like, well, that's fine, you know. I don't need it. I'll build teams and, you know, have fun. And it's really been in this last year, in these last few months especially, that God's really been putting on my heart, especially since I'm going into full-time ministry and maybe working with youth. That evangelism is something that's a part of your everyday life. It's no different than eating, breathing, walking. As you talk to other people, this is something that needs to be on the forefront of your mind. I read a book this last semester called, um, Bill Hybels, I think it's called Just Walk Across the Room. And basically, it just talks about the simplicity and the practical ways of evangelism. The fact of just walking across the room and talking to someone is just a practical way to reach out. So I'm going to go to Genesis, Genesis 30. It talks about Jacob. At this point, it's just past the point when Jacob has finally acquired Rachel after the seven years of Leah, now the seven years of Rachel. He finally tells his father-in-law, he goes, Dad, I need to go home. I need to visit my parents. I need to take my wives and my children, and I need to leave. And Laban, Laban says, no, I can't let you do that. You know, you've been profitable for business. Ever since you've been here, the Lord has blessed us. And he says, let me double your wages. Whatever you want, name it, I'll do it. And Jacob goes, no, I gotta get home. I gotta leave. And he goes, and he says, but here's the deal. He goes, let me take all of your spotted, speckled sheep and let me start my own business. I'll continue to work for you. And as I do so, let me, take, let me basically take your flawed mer merchandise and let me start up that and I can start my own business to the point where I can or can I at least provide for my own family. So I'm gonna, after that, that same day, Laban said, okay, as you said it, let it be done. 
That same day, that afternoon, he told his sons to take every spotted, speckled sheep and goat and gave them a three-day journey from where they were at to take them away from Jacob. So it starts here in uh, 30, 37, Genesis. Jacob, however, took fresh-cut branches from poplar, almond, and plane trees and made white stripes on them by peeling the bark and exposing the white inner wood of the branches. Then he placed the peeled branches in all the watering troughs so that they, were, they would be directly in front of the flocks when they came to drink. When the flocks were in heat and came to drink, they made it in front of the branches, and they bore young that were streaked or speckled or spotted. Now your first question might be, what do branches and mating have to do with each other? Your second question might be, where can I get some of those branches? <laughs> but that's not what we're talking about. When I read this, I really, I obviously didn't take it in a literal sense. I was looking at this very allegorical. And I was saying, how often do we reproduce what we see? The sheep and the goats, they would go to the watering trough, and as they would look down, they would see the reflection. And after Jacob put those branches in there, they would see themselves, and they would see the speckled and spotted, and it would reflect on them. And then when they made it, they would have children like that. They reproduced what they saw. And how often do we reproduce what we see in the mirror? This morning I came to you in sweats. I wasn't feeling too good. I got some tea, I got sick from a bunch of junior hires this weekend. But honestly, if I was your pastor in front of an entire congregation, would this affect the way, the outcome of my sermon? Because I know it does for me. The fact is that I reproduce what I see in the mirror. So to make a point, I have to be ready to make my own reproduction. If I'm gonna speak, I need to be ready to reproduce what I want. <clears throat> you can't spiritually be in sweats and expect to reproduce what God has for you. The fact is, is so often, I know in my personal life, I have trouble waking up early to do like devotions and prayer. You know, I try to put it off to the end of the day, then I realize I have homework, then you know the fiance wants like her time too, and eventually gets pushed off, pushed off to the end of the night. And I'm getting in bed, you know, I pull it up and I'll read a chapter and I'll be like, all right, you know, like I, I did my time. But what would happen if you took the extra time in the morning, if you actually got ready for your day and had some preparation for what God had 